And we're going to get you black. Yeah, three minutes, okay, guys? Wow, yeah, that's great. Right. <laughs> All right. Take some deep breaths. You got it. I have patience. Oh, that's so close. <laughs> I know Brianna is going to be around all week. She had some things in the office. Yeah, it's a big thing. <laughs> well, we're glad you could be here. It was like the one.
So we're going to get you labbed up so you don't have to use a, a wireless mic. That's okay. And then I'll do a short intro and then we'll get you right in. And then some QA. We can even go as far as 30 minutes. <laughs> Sound good? We're happy to have you. This looks like it's a big one. You guys all set? Thank you for being patient. I always step back down. Okay. I guess we're going to um, allow people to funnel in, but we'll get started since you guys are here and on time. So, um, again, I think you guys have known this, but we at HitLab are a healthcare innovation technology lab that helps leading organizations ideate, create, and evaluate and diffuse technology-based solutions to pressing healthcare challenges. Our team is located right here on the CMC campus, as well as <clears throat> satellite offices in New Delhi and Accra, Ghana. So today's seminar series is a part of HitLab's diffusion strategy, and it aims to bring together the CUMC community, as well as the greater New York City area on the latest topics in digital health. Dr. Robert Reiner, our speaker for today, is the executive director and founder of Behavioral Associates, has been practicing psychology since 1981. After receiving his undergraduate degree at UPenn, he went on to get his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Alabama and serve his clinical internship at Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Reiner can frequently be seen and quoted in the news and media and is often called upon to make appearances on major news networks for his expert opinion. Throughout his career, he has served as psychological consultant for several corporations as well as an expert witness for a number of criminal trials. He is well known for his work in treating anxiety and phobias through biofeedback and virtual reality therapy. He has been credited for his for this work in articles in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, New York Daily News, USA Today, Newsweek, and Time Out Magazine. He has specifically had great success in treating patients for fear of flying, which was documented on an episode of National Geographic show featuring Dr. Rhino's work with a phobia patient, which we will actually see a video of today. He is co-author of The Fearless Smile, Overcoming Dental Phobia, a book on the subject of people suffering from dental phobias and how they can be effectively treated. The book published in January 2012 was written by Dr. Reiner along with two well-known Manhattan dentists. Dr. Reiner currently serves on the ethics board at the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research and teaches neurofeedback certification courses on a regular basis. He served on the faculty of NYU Medical Center, Department of Psychiatry from 1980 to 2015, and is a guest lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania Psychology Department. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reiner. I'm thinking with all those credentials, I want to meet this guy. <laughs> so, um, 
first of all, can you guys all move in this way so I can talk to you? <laughs> Not to look to my left? Is that too much to ask? Well, um, who am I talking to? What's your training? Medical students? Uh, help me out. I, I need to know what level to talk to you guys on. Do you have science backgrounds? Yeah. I'm probably medical student, and I go I do Thank you. Thank you. Any other volunteers? Yeah. A little louder, sorry. I'm a health coach, personal training, and nutrition. Okay, good, okay. Yeah. Uh, an assistant professor at Yale. Uh -huh. uh, in what field? In animal medicine. Okay. I'm a radiologist and board certified hypnotist. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Um, I started doing virtual reality back in 1999. Can you all see me? Is the mic working? I was a grad student uh, in 1979 uh, when there were dinosaurs around. And uh, there was a, a technique used for phobic anxiety in those days, some of you may have heard of, called systematic desensitization. It was by a guy named Joseph Volpe. Uh, he's a South African psychiatrist. I thought it was a great idea, but uh, there was no technology around to do it in a way that I thought would be useful. He had his patient, it was a counter conditioning procedure. He advocated patients, he would get them deeply relaxed using relaxation training. And uh, what's the light hypnosis technique? And then he would ask them to imagine they were in the phobic situation. You know, and I said to myself, after having exactly one year of clinical experience, uh, it just didn't seem realistic that you'd ask a phobic person, a person who spent their whole life avoiding something, to develop meaningful imagery. Uh, and I, I, I actually never ever used that technique. But I remember thinking at the time, if something like virtual reality, which I knew the military was doing, and commercial airlines were using to train their pilots, ever became available, it would change my profession. And it was 20 years later, I was watching CNN. And sure enough, Pentium computers finally became powerful enough to drive the software. Um, and I made a couple of calls, did some digging. And two weeks later, there was a conference down in New Orleans and I flew down there and met the early pioneers in the field. Uh, most of whom are still my good friends. Uh, in those days, the uh, it was primitive, I'll tell you that. It looked, like, it looked like a cartoon. And I remember thinking to myself, for $15,000, I'm buying a system that was not half as good as a Sony PlayStation game for $29.99 in the store. Anyone guess what the reason for that is? It's an economic decision. There's no market. Millions of kids are buying Sony PlayStation games for 30 bucks. Not too many people are buying virtual reality systems. So I spent $15,000 to buy a bunch of cartoons, basically. And when I first saw them, I said, I'm returning this. Until I realized that the system that I wanted to buy cost $5 million. Um, so I was stuck with it. And you know what? It worked. Um, it worked well enough. It turned out, and we did a lot of research on this. I'm going to show you guys in a second a video uh, on, on some of this stuff. Um, you don't have to really be immersed in it completely for this thing to work. You've just got to capture enough of the autonomic nervous system to get a response. And it's easy to measure that response. I, I, I'm not a real believer. I don't have a lot of faith in human nature when it comes to I know how this affects me. Turns out we use you know, good old biofeedback group, something called GSR, galvanic skin resistance, which is a device used as a lie detector. A basic polygraph has three things in it. A machine that measures respiration, EKG, and GSR, galvanic skin resistance. When you get anxious, way before the fight or flight response is activated, tiny amounts of fluid beneath the fingertips are secreted. Now, electricity moves more easily across fluid and skin tissue, and the change in resistance gets picked up. 
A polygraph is not measuring when you're lying. It's based on the assumption that if you're lying, you're anxious about it, which is not always true. Of course. Psychopaths make great liars, and they actually believe this stuff sometimes. Uh, so that's why it's not admissible in a court of law, and there should have been. Um, so you know what? As a believer in uh, a, picture worth, a picture is worth a thousand words, I think a video is worth a million. Let me show you some of that early stuff. This was a uh, reproduction done in, I think it was 2002, uh, by National Geographic. When I presented our research findings in May of 2001 in Laval, France, it was the first international virtual reality conference. And uh, by this point, we've been doing it for two years, and we found that by combining biofeedback, everybody here know what that is? Anyone here doesn't know what it is? Biofeedback is a way, imagine I hook your heart up to a monitor, and on the screen you see your heart rate. It says 68, 69, because it's prorating it by the minute, right? And there's a bar there, and the bar goes up when your heart rate goes up, and it goes down when it goes down. And I say to you, make the bar go down, lower your heart rate. And you look, you know, I have 10 head. How do I do that without holding my breath? Uh, Neil Miller in the late 60s, right here at Rockefeller, did that early work and found out that humans could control the autonomic nervous system. And this was way against the prevailing theory at the time. The paradigm in academic learning theory was there's two nervous systems, the voluntary and the involuntary. When I was taking the psychology at the University of Pennsylvania in 1972, it was actually called the involuntary nervous system. And that was a real pie in the face when Neil Miller said, no, watch this. And sure enough, you could take a mouse under the right conditions and have them raise blood pressure in one ear and lower it in the other to get a reward. You can shape almost anything using operative conditioning. All this stuff is conditionable. The big thing now being brainwaves. One of the first big publications in biofeedback occurred at Montefiore. Well, no, Einstein, actually. They took a, uh, a cat, they deprived it of food and water for 24 hours. And there's a division the center of, of felines the occipital area. There's a very unusual brain wave that randomly is produced about once a month in nature. But that, there were obviously no written instructions here, but the cat had to produce that brain wave to get nourishment. Within 24 hours, it was producing it nonstop. I tell that story to people who say, how does biofeedback work? <laughs> it's just, most of what we experience in life is not, they're not things we're consciously attending to. We, as humans, in our arrogance, we like to believe that what we see is all there is. Of course, the more we learn about science, the less true that becomes. It's been a march away from that. It's humbling, actually. To put things in perspective, the vision center, our occipital lobe, takes in 10 million bits of data per second. The rest of the four senses take in another million. An Ethernet cable takes in the same amount. We attend to 40 of them. 40 out of 10 million. Think about that. So obviously, what we're seeing is a tiny fraction of what there is. So anyway, we presented this stuff. We combined biofeedback. And now, what started with a 60% success rate in reducing phobic anxiety. And this means a person comes, and they can't give a speech. They can't give a toast at their friends wedding, they're phobic about public speaking. Or they can't board a plane, and their kid's getting married in a different country, and they can't go. You know? um, because when people come to us, they've tried everything. Most people are ashamed of their phobias. Uh, this is a woman, I'm going to show you in a second, who uh, National Geographic came to us after we got back from France, we were publishing they, we were getting a 92% success rate. Uh, we were staggered by that. Uh, we were combining a technique called heart rate variability or respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is an abdominal breathing technique. And uh, you, you know, anyone taking a yoga class here? First thing they teach you is belly breathing, right? Slow, relaxed, about five seconds in, five seconds out. Um, but they don't tell you why it's so relaxing. The reason it works so well is because it activates baroreceptors. Let me elaborate. 
when you inhale, you get a slight increase in heart rate. There's some sympathetic arousal. When you exhale, the opposite happens. But after about five minutes of proper breathing, and we use a strain gauge right around the stomach to make sure they're breathing properly, you'll notice the heart rate begins to sink up. In other words, when you inhale, your heart rate climbs. When you exhale, it drops. You'll see that in a second. And when that happens, when they move into phase, it activates baroreceptors, which basically give an all-clear sign to the heart. It's physiologically impossible to be anxious when you're in this state. It temporarily disables all firefighter activity. So we decided that was going to be what we pair up our stimulus with. And that's what doubled our success rate. It went from 60% to 92%. It was a big deal. Uh, and, uh, so anyway, National Geographic said, look, we want a video. We're gonna, we'll pay a patient. We want to do a documentary on your work. But we're also going to show the film if the treatment doesn't work. Are you willing to do that? I said, sure. 90% are pretty good odds. So the woman they brought in was a teacher at Dalton who had a fear of flying was so severe that if a plane came in too low and she thought she could see the faces of the people on the plane, she'd have a panic attack. It activated. Um, now, as a teacher at Dalton with 12 year old kids, they go to Central Park a lot. Central Park, you know, is right across the river. And when the planes make the approach to LaGuardia, they're low sometimes. If she's out there on a spring day, plane comes in low, she panics and runs away, leaving 14, 12-year-old kids with rich parents in the middle of Central Park. They were going to fire her, but cooler heads prevailed, and they said, look, we'll give you one chance. Go get some treatment. So that's who they brought. And I got to tell you, <coughs> it was weird, because you're a psychologist. And you're used to working behind closed doors in the silence, you know. So to, have, to be in a room with a patient who you're trying to develop rapport with and to have a guy with a, a boom mic in your face and a camera, um, it took a while to get used to it, but we did. Uh, now, mean length of treatment is 12 to 16 sessions. I think this took 18 only because of the time it took her and probably me to get used to it. But uh, we can usually get baseline data now because we've been doing this for 18 years and tell people when they can book a flight based on what we see after the first session with pretty high accuracy. If, this is a big if, they got to practice stuff at home. If they don't practice the breathing techniques, it's not going to work. You know, before I became a psychologist, I taught tennis for a living. And you think to yourself, what could be more different? Tennis court. But you know, there's a lot of similarities. Because there are people who came in once a week for tennis lessons and you know, tennis is fundamentally a hard game. The physics of the sport make it difficult. It's a it's relatively short court with a high net. And unless you're 10 feet tall, you can't hit a serve hard, flat, and go, you have to go in the box. you got to cut it. And learning anything new, changing a grip, is really difficult in any sport. Golf, tennis, no, you know, it feels like this is impossible. I'm going to do it. I didn't know at the time, but I was doing cognitive behavior therapy. Because I'd say, you know what, that's good that it feels bad. That's your signal that you're doing it right. The worse you feel, the better tennis player you're going to be. So bring on that bad feeling. That's cognitive restructuring. That's what we do and teach people to do every day to our patients, to restructure something. And if I taught them that that was a signal for doing the correct thing, it motivated them. Now, they, learning anything by definition means failure. And that's what keeps most people from learning new things especially in their free time. But you know, I can tell when people practice. Because most people, because tennis is a hard game, just wanted to hit with someone who I could put the ball in people's racket and make them have a lot more fun. That was enough for most people. But they didn't get better. So um, let me fast forward these. We have audio here, right? OK. Uh, by the way, this is what I just spoke to you about at the biofeedback screen. Uh, huh? Yeah, I should put it there. Oh, All right, here it is.
Oh, this might have been sliced with something else. I'm not sure. So. Is there a Wi-Fi here? Yeah, I just want to Time out. My fears of flying began, um, I would say, almost eight, nine years ago. I think the first time I started to feel a sense of fear about flying was when I watched the movie Alive. <laughs> People who have phobias about flying, My son. Uh, well, very often it's the only phobia they have. But very often it's not. Very often a fear of flying is really a fear of being closed in or claustrophobic. I think it was cool when I was a kid. I went to Italy when I was 12 years old. There was no fears. And then I, once I became a teenager and kind of understood, you know, as you get older, you realize, you know, how precious life is and how quickly it could be taken away. And that's when it really kind of set in for me. It's completely non-related to intelligence. Anybody who ever says to a phobic patient, you're such a smart person, how could you think the plane's going to go down when you know all the statistics? isn't revealing much insight into human nature. I, I would physically feel like I had no control and I didn't know how to make myself feel safe. I would define it as a phobia when it comes disabling and disruptive to your own life or the people around you. Virtual reality is really uh, giving patients a sense of experiencing the phobic situation. Now, there's different ways to do it. Uh, you can do it by showing people slides or a video of being in a plane, but the virtual reality, these glasses right here, provide what I think is the closest approximation because you get a 3D image, like a high-end video game. Why does not prepared for arrival? But you're, you're really all around it, you know, or it's all around you. You're in a, quote, virtual world. We control the entire environment, create thunderstorms, Flash was the thunderstorm. And I feel some rumbling in the sea. That's what she's seeing. We can expose patients to whatever area of the flight is that creates the most anxiety. Let me just say one important thing that this left out of me. One of the most important devices here is something called the butt kicker. Uh, it's from uh, any gamers would know what it is. You know when you go to a Sony IMAX theater, the seat vibrates during those. It's kind of, it's, that's 90 watts, and it gets you going. This is 1100. You feel exactly like you feel in a plane when the door closes. Uh, you know, that's stuff we don't think about. But if you're claustrophobic, that door closes. Bam! That's a big moment. You're stuck in there, and that's very often an activator for phobic anxiety. So we attach the butt kicker which is about a 14 pound, feels like a bowling ball, but uh, it's a, well, it's a subwoofer basically, but you know, powerful. It doesn't move sound waves, it moves furniture. Uh, the chair will literally bounce up and down at the high level. So simulating a car or a plane taking off, uh, or the subtlety of the transmission of a good manual transmission, it picks it all up. Uh, it's astonishing how good it is. So. Uh, that adds to it. You know, the more senses you get, the uh, in our brains are wired this way to protect us. If one sense gets activated, like if you're walking around at night, you see leaves blowing, you think it's a snake. You know, the fact that you don't, you may not hear anything, or that's the only sense. Yeah, maybe not. But if two or three senses are activated, the brain goes into action, and the startle response gets activated very quickly. Taking off is the worst part of the flight for me. Once I'm up in the air, as long as we're pretty steady, I'm okay. But the taking off is just an unnatural feeling for me. This is your captain speaking. Do you have your place? You're on schedule. That's our GSR. All right, Claudia, you're going to take off soon. So I'd like you looking out the window now, please. That's the bug kicking you here.
also put a scarf around people's head to keep the light out. We found that in almost all cases, when people have anxiety attacks when they're flying, they begin hyperventilating. Hyperventilation is the kind of, it, it's, it causes problems because people become chest breathers instead of abdominal breathers. In other words, they're breathing from the thoracic area instead of the diaphragm. Our high success rate in treating fear of flying with virtual reality is augmented by the biofeedback, which teaches people to generate a state called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Like this. Some people hate this because you got to stick It's not something we're neurologically wired or inclined to do to abdominally breathe. So one of the first things that we do with our patients is to teach them how to counteract this by engaging in diaphragmatic breathing, and that's the effect of the biofeedback. Let me take you through it. This is a, a device called GSR or EDR, measuring your anxiety. It's pretty much similar to a polygraph. It's picking up changes in your level of anxiety. Now, when we first started, down on the ground, you were down here. This is when we began. Okay. Okay. Now, when the plane began to taxi, you felt the first movement, you got very anxious here. Then you seemed relieved when the flight attendant came on, the female, and you were still okay. So down to you nice and relaxed, everything's going fine, as we're taxiing, a slight Increase here when the captain spoke, but you still relatively relaxed. When the engine accelerated again, your heart accelerated. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> what? What? How accurate it is. <laughs> when that happens, when you breathe diaphragmatically, there's a rapid increase in heart rate, and when you exhale diaphragmatically, there's a rapid drop. When that happens, you're in a state of respiratory sinus arrhythmia. The body does not manufacture adrenaline and norepinephrine. In other words, the body's fight or flight response shuts off. And you physiologically cannot experience anxiety when you're breathing that way. I didn't think I would be as calm as I was today. I really felt so relaxed and calm, I, I could have fallen asleep, and I wasn't anticipating that. From the controlled breathing, I. I'm, I can't feel any anxiety. I'm so relaxed and sedated. When we actually lay the treatment out and show people physiologically how they're responding and then physiologically how they're responding when they breathe properly and they see it and they feel better. And I say to them, you see what you feel right now? Which is after they've had the um, diaphragmatic breathing training with the cardiac feedback. I said, imagine if you could feel like this when you're flying. They say, Doc, if I could feel like this, I'd be cured. I think maybe this can be effective. That's a big corner to turn, by the way, when they feel what it feels like. There's a lot of people that have never felt that much in their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, U.S. Air Shuttle, welcome to New Washington. The local time is 11 o'clock. Please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened. So essentially, you, you have this strategy. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I tell you, as a professional therapist, it's pretty gratifying. I mean, I'm, you know, most of the time I do what every other shrink in New York does, um, you know, talk therapy. But to get something that is so tangible, uh, I, I don't think I would have continued working if this hadn't happened. Uh, and the things that followed it, which is, I'll talk about later. But, you know, these procedures that, are, you know, you get somebody in and out in four or five months, and it's life changing for people. You know, if you can't give a speech, which is a very common phobia, I'm sure everybody here knows someone who's that way. Even to the point where you got five people around a conference table, everyone's got to go around the room, give their name, say where they were from. Uh, four sentences is terrifying. I mean, 
stuff that we've used virtual reality for, the different types of phobia, it's incredible the things. That's where you gotta be creative. I met a guy once, there were five words in the English language he couldn't hear without having a panic attack. One of them was chairperson. He would actually hand out notices to people he met and say, please don't say these five words. Another guy, we called him the schnoggle patient. If he did this, he, he got out of taxis at four o'clock in the morning, he had gotten to that. He left Broadway show, and, you know, go figure, right? Um, one guy couldn't be in a car that made a left turn. So uh, you have to now create your own scenes because the, as you saw right there, the flying scene is a canned thing. It's, you get a program and you've got all these options, you know, thunderstorm, takeoff, landing. Um, the software does that for you. But when somebody gets a panic attack, if someone's speaking in a southern accent, you know, we're not going to find that on the shelf anywhere. Uh, not in the north anyway. Uh, so here you got to be creative. And now, you saw that this is what psychologists doing virtual reality were buying 15 years ago. And it worked. You know, it was expensive, but it, 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 it worked. And uh, it was pretty good for the time. Sorry. Okay. Comment now. We'll play anyway. Well, I, I was just comparing uh, the imagery from 15 years ago. Uh, so you have yeah. Samsung yeah, it's here, and it's, it's really like you're right, and you know what? If someone showed me that 15 years ago, I would have felt like I was in, you know, impossible. Like, and that's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the Moore's law, right? Yeah. Question: um, This kind of makes me think about some of like uh, some urban schools. I think sometimes where children are you know, maybe getting into problems, and they've used like big meditation techniques instead of yeah. punishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, Well, it's used in a lot of ways. We, um, pain management, for example. I, I treated somebody when I was faculty at NYU. Uh, as some of you may know, burn victims, uh, one of the most horrifying things about getting bad burns is getting your wounds cleaned, which have to do it every day. Uh, it's, I mean, your nerves are exposed. Could you imagine soap and water or alcohol? I mean, it's, and people faint from it sometimes. So we designed the virtual reality program putting people in ice, like an ice storm. Now, the way our brains are, we can only pay attention to one thing at a time, uh, most of the time. And it reduced reported pain about 75%. We wrote this up somewhere. Uh, so people really would be cold and shivering. And it's very easy to trick the brain. Uh, magicians do it all the time. What's happening right now is even academic psychologists are getting good at not only predicting how human beings are so irrational, but what kind of irrational mistakes we're gonna make. And it's affecting public policy. I'll give you an example. Do you take two cultures that are very similar, Germany and Austria? In one country, 8% of people donate their organs they get killed in a car accident. For the other, it's about close to 85%. Why does that happen? It's the dumbest thing. If you have to make a check on your driver's license, right? You people, people don't. If you don't check it in one culture, your organs get donated. In the other culture, they don't. And humans being fundamentally lazy, they don't. And that's how it does. So. Should that affect public policy? The fact that you know that people are lazy and aren't going to make a stand. Because they don't, very often when people get anxious, when they're faced with a decision that makes them nervous, they solve the problem by ignoring it. And it works in the short run. Until you need an organ. <laughs> See? So are you being sneaky if you're writing public policy and you take advantage of that so you can get more organs? Is that for the public good, donating organs? then your own beliefs come in to government policy. It's an interesting question. So the answer to your question, as I went around and around and around, is yes. We're using it a lot of different ways. Kids meditating, um, 
we have, uh, we do different things to kids who are hyperactive. You're talking about ADD, basically, right? Well, sometimes maybe trouble, like, usually I was reading about trouble, like, anxiety, you know, oh. like, you know. testosterone stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is very awesome. Yeah. Male nonsense. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I'll have to talk about that later, but, um, there are other techniques that work much better than that. But, you know, I guess you can be creative. And see, it's hard to get kids who are revved up to sit down with them. You know, we, we call that symptom preventing treatment. I always think back when I, I was a child care worker for neglected and abused kids before I became a psychologist. Uh, and uh, one of my many part time jobs. And when kids had seizures, the you know, last kid had dry mall seizures. You know, you gotta get in close because kids bite their lips and their tongue and you know, they're out of control. But they're kicking and screaming and they're, you know, they could be pretty strong, you know, 16 year old kids having seizures. So they are preventing you from helping them by their symptoms, symptoms prevent treatment, you see. And that happens in a lot of cases, certainly with ADD. You know, the old theory in ADD was these kids were hyper, they had too much energy, so, Let's give them a stimulant. That sounds like a great idea. And it calms them down, proof that they're weirdos. But that whole theory was nonsense, because we now know, of course, that ADD is you are hypo, not hyper. Your brain's moving too slow. Kids with ADD very often, by the way, are cortically immature. And if you wait a year, they'll be fine. But we love our pills in this country. So they throw out a lot. And, uh, uh, so I won't go in that direction. But the, the point is this, is that if your brain, if you're producing too many theta waves, uh, and you, you can do a QEEG right now very easily and tell what's wrong with someone's brain. We have a database. We know exactly what a person's brain ought to look like at all 88 problem areas at every stage of life from 2 to 82. And uh, when there's a dysregulation, say you're producing too many beta waves in the back. We know that's associated with anxiety, you know. But a little bit lower, and you got someone who's really alert. You know, beta waves are usually quick waves like that, 14, 16, 18 hertz. Uh, delta waves, the waves that go when you sleep, one to four hertz, really long, lazy waves. Well, it was EEG up until about a year ago in the work that we did was a real pain because you had to put gel in. So you get these cloth caps. And you know, we do 19 channel work right now. We can get deep into the brain with that. But you, know, you get all this junk in your hair. Well, women who have went back to work flat out wouldn't do it. I don't blame them. You know, unless the ones that kept hair dryers and shampoo, and they washed their hair afterwards. Because you, know, you have this gunk in your hair. Um, a group uh, out of California, a bunch of uh, actually physicists and electrical engineers have built a dry cap. You can now read human EEG without any gel. That's astonishing. Uh, when I first, I, as soon as it became available, I bought it. Um, the guy who was making it was charging absurd amounts. He, he wanted forty thousand dollars for it, and I said, if you can get forty thousand dollars out of any psychologist, you know, I'll give you forty thousand dollars. Just knowing how cheap my profession. I said, I'll get 20 people and we'll give you half that. And that's what we did. And it's astonishing. Man. Does that work by itself? Yeah. Um, and so uh, technology is moving quick. Um, there's a lot of other things to do besides that that I've probably described. Um, yep. I, I brought some gadgets with me to show you guys. There's a lot of great stuff right now. It's, and it works. Uh, you know, let me go through this, and then we'll hold our questions. I think that's probably what I would do. Uh, anyway, this is the how things are. This is this is the this is back 2004, right? This big clunker. And this was only half of it, by the way. <laughs> it, uh, there was a there was box with it right there, and that people got headaches after a while. That thing was heavy, and you still had light coming in. So. Then Sony got into the field. It's like this came and then this. Then. This was a, a big success. This is 2012. Uh, that, that followed this. But now, 
this is the future. This. You guys, these are probably out of style, out of date right now, but uh, you know, the goggles, Samsung, you guys know this, right? Put a cell phone in. Well, a group in the, out of Barcelona, Spain, a bunch of tech guys, they were the first people to use this technology way before you heard, you heard of Samsung in this field. And uh, they actually built it for my profession, amazingly. Dumb business people, but happy for me. Uh, we did the beta testing for it, and it was pretty effective. You pay 100 bucks a month, and you're set up. And they've got everything. I mean, you know, we. We track for six months. I, I, in my place, I do all the intakes. So I meet three or four new people every day. So you really get a sense of, at least the pulse of the front line of the Upper East Side anyway, on what's bothering people. And uh, I recorded all my forward people for a year, what kind of forward they had. They built their marketing plan around that and then moved the company because they won a very prestigious tech award. And uh, with their cash prize, they moved from Barcelona to the uh, Bay Area, where they are right now. Something's called SIOS, P-S-I-O-U-S. Uh, and this is their stuff. See the spider right there? That was, uh, I, I showed them a videotape of, I had a guy who was absolutely terrified of spiders. And he was marrying a woman, or he was engaged, and her family owned an inn up in the, uh, somewhere up in New England. And a lot of spiders there. And she said, I'm not marrying you if you can't go there. So you figure it out. She gave him six months. And uh, we did our thing, you know, and he was fine. But I, um, you know, when you do this for a living, you meet some unusual people. At the Museum of Natural History, they have these people who love bugs. And I think they got a scorpion guy, they got a tarantula guy, you know, everybody. And, and, uh, I like those guys. You know. So I had a, a videotape. The guy got so good, we had a, he had a tarantula. And you can't take the poison out of these things. It's not like a snake. But they're really pretty calm creatures. They only bite you if you mess with them. So I let this thing walk up my arm. Right? On video, they're right on the steps they did. And then the guy did it. Uh, it was interesting, I was recording GSR simultaneously. And it went up, as any of you know, But it, was, it held, he held, he didn't panic. He got good at the breathing, so um, he probably used one of one of these machines here. And by the way, the newer stuff look is cool looking; doesn't work any better. The stats have stayed the same. So the amount of time stayed the same. The equipment got cheaper. The fees went up with inflation. But uh, that's my point: is that. Most of what is getting us, what changes our brains, we're not even aware of. Yeah, see, the, you don't have to pay attention to this stuff. It goes on beyond the scenes. The brain is constantly extracting information and we're learning. The goal of the brain, remember this, is to save glucose. I mean, you've got this two or three pound piece of meat sitting in your skull that has no contact with the outside world. So much so that you can operate on a person's brain while they're awake. Well, there's no sense mechanisms that they, you know, and they do it by the way, right? But that that two or three pound piece of meat, which represents five percent of our body weight, requires twenty to twenty-five percent of the blood. The demands are enormous for the human brain. It's which is the most spectacular thing in the universe, it really, is, because. To, get a, to build a computer that did everything the brain could do, as, as far as pattern recognition goes, would require an entire city street with a nuclear power plant running it. Um, and ours takes 20, a cheeseburger <laughs> runs our brain. It's extraordinary. And easy to trick, because that's what all this stuff is. It's smoke and mirrors, basically. Virtual reality is tricking the brain. I mean, everybody now has experienced virtual reality, right? It's astonishing, isn't it? How, for a hundred bucks, you can travel to Spain or anywhere. I mean, people just stop traveling. It's the same experience. And now, 
we're able to monitor all their vitals very carefully. Uh, and people do respond in similar ways. So that's what this is doing. Um, OK, this is an interesting point that comes up a lot, the, the concept of dichotomous thinking. Human beings engage in this. Now, there are a number of errors that people make that we take advantage of. One of them, and this is a big C, cognitive behavior therapy issue, it's dichotomous thinking, either or thinking. You know, oh, he's a good person, oh, he's a bad person. Everybody knows that's nonsense, but our brains fire that way. You know, we love to categorize very quickly. You know, people, you give them a small amount of information and they make up their minds, and they think they're right. It's, and th that has caused so many problems in terms of people that make public policy. That's why when people say, I felt it in my gut, that tells me you're an idiot. Because you know that stuff doesn't work long term. It's been proven over and over again. Sure, sometimes somebody with a lot of experience, uh, and if they're doing the same thing every day, but when there are a lot of variables, like the weather, you don't rely on people's guts. Rely on science. Rely on statistics. You, uh, this is taking advantage of the fact that you go into a store and if you're buying suntan oil. Do you think your brain can tell any difference at all if something says 0.001% of these people who use this develop skin cancer from an extra two digits? Right. Same thing. Whereas one may be 100,000 people, the other could be 10 million people. It's a lot of big difference. But our brains don't work that way. Uh, there's It turns out in virtual reality that if you show somebody a picture of, or an image of somebody saving money, it'll actually cause the person to become more prudent about money for 24 hours. Uh, if you show someone a, in virtual reality being kind to somebody, and they've studied this, people will become more generous for 24 hours, 48 hours. And that's just a two minute clip. So, Think back to what I told you before about these pain patients. It's, you know, we're incredibly receptive to stimuli flowing through our senses. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. When I, when I interned at Bellevue in 1979, two strange things were happening in the ER that summer no one could figure out at the time. Young, healthy men were coming in with old man diseases, like Carposis sarcoma. And of course, we later understood it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in New York. But the second weird thing was people with no neurologic histories were coming in having grand mal seizures. No one could figure it out. They never had a seizure before. So it's finally figured out the one thing all these people had in common, they had been in clubs in the past two years. You know, in the late 70s, Travolta's Flick Saturday Night Fever came out, but the disco scene in, in Brooklyn. And clubs started open all over the city. That's when 54 opened up, the mud club, machines, um, stuff you guys never heard of. But uh, the city was on fire. And what do all these clubs have in common when you walk into this strobe light? Well, it turns out that our brains are replicators. You expose someone to strobe at 14 hertz, which is the SMR zone in the human brain, and people feel kind of elated. It's like an uplifting feeling. Well, what was happening with these people, because the brain was affected by the stroke, people were crossing some particular threshold who may not have done it before so quickly, and they were having seizures. But then this guy, Dave Sievert, up in I think, Canada somewhere, said, wait a minute, I can make some money on this. And he started building these weird machines of flashlights and sound. And it worked. We monitor EEG, and sure enough, you change brainwaves just like that. This is this machine right now. Little box like this. Oh, forgive the wires, but put these on. They even have them in color now. Different colors stimulate different kind of emotions. All 
verified through FDA approval. Um, people who can't sleep do really well with this. Uh, I've had a lot of surgery in my life. Um, I've played squash in college with the pen, and it's murder on the knees, so I've had four arthroscopies. And just last year, I played tennis, called my rotator cuff, uh, and that's bad surgery. I had to sleep in a chair for six weeks. Uh, but uh, I would be woken up in pain, and I put this thing on six hertz, four hertz, and it put me right back to sleep. It worked, it makes you sleepy. My kids, one of my kids is a bad sleeper, and he uses it too. But think of that, the possibilities. You can control people's brain waves with a $400 machine. What? Bigot, can someone mic her up? Thank you. I have one quick question here. So for sleep apnea, this technique works? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. For sleep apnea. Yeah, oh, sleep apnea? No, sleep apnea is something different. Uh, that's, some, that's, a, that's an air pipe closing up. So, uh, no. I wish it did. Maybe a stent. <laughs> um, that, that's, to diagnose sleep apnea requires a sleep study. And uh, it's, people literally are waking up terrified because there's no air getting into their lungs. That's a medical problem. But pain management is, is a psychological and a physical issue. There's a, a, a whole lot of difference between um, looking at an x-ray or, I'm sure you see this all the time, you know it. You take 100 people off the streets and you analyze their spine uh, and correlate that with reports of pain. What's the correlation? Not 1-0, is it? Not even, huh? It's just about zero. Yeah. So there are the, some times the most times. correct, like if you sever your spinal column. The perception of pain is subject to all these different things, and no one's figured it out. Um, what we do know, for example, um, are any psychology majors here? Smart. Um, there's a, a test that we use called the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. That's the test that. Uh, it's the most widely used personality test in the world. Uh, you can't be a cop in any city without taking it. You can't be a commercial pilot. You can't work in a nuclear power plant. Uh, it's an intrusive test. It's over 500 true false questions, but it's damn good. It's the best in the business. And there are the first three scales are the kind of neuroticism scales. They measure hypochondriacal thinking, depression, both state and trait, and hysteria. And Think about that. You've got someone who is hypochondriacal or hysterical, but they don't feel depressed. They express their uh, well, negative affect through their body. So they get, and we all know people like that. When they get upset, they get a headache or a backache, or you, you know, that's. Everyone follow me on this? Okay. Whereas other people, when they feel lousy, they say, I'm depressed. I don't want to get out of bed. You know, I got no energy. Now, those two populations are very different. Well, in studies on orthopedic surgery, back surgeons, guys who operate on the back, a lot of the more enlightened ones are using the MMPI now. Because if you're elevated on scales one and three, the odds of you reporting a drop in symptoms following surgery are next to none. They're invested in it. On the other hand, you get someone with a lot of depression in their personality, and very little conversion stuff going on, they're probably, am I running out of time? Sorry, guys. They're probably five times as likely to report relief from symptoms. So psychological factors are a big deal. How much time I got? I'm done. Sorry, guys. Um, so this is virtual reality right now. I mean, I, I gave you guys everything there is out there right now. Um, that's pretty much where the, where the, uh, the field is right now. Um, it's, if you know anyone who's thinking about going into mental health, make them, they gotta learn this stuff. I'm amazed that every psychologist is not forced to learn this stuff in grad school. I give as many talks as I can to grad schools to encourage it. And at my place, we have a training program. We train people and they go out and they train other people. 
but we have a technology that really works, and you know, most psychologists spin their wheels with their patients for the simple reason of this. Cognitive behavior therapy works at a cortical level, the cerebral cortex. Is, what makes us human is our, the prefrontal cortex right behind the forehead. That's what gives us a sense of tomorrow. You know? Whereas most of the action is in the cerebellum. And the only thing that affects that is virtual reality and biofeedback and medications. So talk therapy is limited. It works for certain things, but it's limited. Um, two more quick things now. I'll shut up. Um, it, it was in World War One. A weird thing happened with the medics. They noticed the soldiers had been shot in the back of the head, the occipital lobe, and were blind. Right? A year later, if they survived the wound, if you threw a baseball at the head, they'd duck. Had that happen? It turns out that the startle response that allows a lizard to go to a frog is a different part of the brain entirely, and we have it. See, our brains are a museum of all the stuff. We have flippers, gills, tails, it's all there. We don't use it, but it's there, and that startle response was picked up by the blind people. That's amazing to me. Um, there's a guy named Michio, if you're interested in this, uh, Michio Kaku, who's a physicist at City College, uh, who's, who's my hero. Uh, his hero was Albert Einstein. And uh, he tells the story about Einstein where uh, when Einstein was a really old man, uh, he was down at Princeton, and he, uh, he said to his chauffeur, you know what, I'm sick of the same speech, night, night, night. You know? The chauffeur said, I got a great idea, Dr. Einstein. Let's switch roles. I've got acting skills. I'll get a, a disguise. I know you speak so well, I can say it in my sleep. You sit in the audience, you're my chauffeur. I says, let's do it. And it worked for six speeches over two weeks. But the seventh night, he gave the speech, and this mathematician gave a really complicated, asked a really complicated question. And Einstein's thinking, it's kind of busted. Chauffeur says, that is such an elementary question, my own chauffeur is going to answer it. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's call them night. I have one question. In a real time, in a real world, where basically you can use this technology? Of course, that one is my understanding is that the pain management practices. So in a hospital, in a in the pain management yep. doctors consulting offices. Yep. Uh, another one is example. One of them she mentioned that about the um, kids in a school. Yeah. Uh, where you other? Can use it everywhere. Everywhere, but uh, other places where you can use. Generally, one of the understanding mine is that that the where the psychologist uh, required to assess something, that's the place you can use that. Correct. I'm having trouble understanding. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, does anyone understand what you said? My question is that in a real world, where you can use this? Where you can use it? Uh, yes, where, where you, you can. You, wherever you can use your imagination yeah, is my imagery. answer. See what I mean? It, I mean, like, it's really, wherever you can use your imagination is so my you answer to the question. What? You have to have supervision from a professional. Yes, yes. You can't do this by yourself. You won't know what you're doing. Okay. And there's something called, mo there's a certain kind of, if the technology is not that good, you'll get a lag and you can get motion sickness. You know, people get in the office. You don't want someone puke in your office. But you know what? Look, you, you, most people are trained therapists that I work with, so this is an, another tool in your toolbox. But you still got to use clinical intuition, when to do what, and stuff like that. Yeah? So, Talk so, really loud because you so got no mic. So it's mainly for anxiety disorder and uh, specific phobia. Yeah. Other, yeah. Right? Are there other uh, coping methods? That's what I've been talking about. Yeah. You must have come in late. Uh, pain management, uh, stuff like that. Uh, anything where, uh, I mean, travel agents use it. Real estate brokers use it. Um, we figured out a way, because fear of heights is a big deal. I'll show you this. We figured out a way to get it. You know, all drones have uh, video cameras in them. I figured out a way to wirelessly get the signal from the drone into virtual reality glasses. 
right? And this is a drone, right? The, the, it, so the person who's fear of heights is floating 50 feet up in the air looking down. And they feel it's incredible. And it's fun to do. Did I answer your question? Uh, Anybody can use your well, imagination as the answer. Well, I'm like, in psychiatry, so I can what? see where this can be used. What? I'm in psychiatry. You're so psychiatry, yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I can see where this can be used. Yeah. I'm, I'm just asking, are there evidence for other, like... You, you know what, you should call, if you call me, this is, a, this is a complicated question you're asking me. If you call me in my office, I'll discuss it with you. Okay. Um, is my number up here somewhere? Be Behavioral Associates is the name of the company, easy to remember. My name is Rob Reiner, like the actor. Think, think meathead. Director. What's that? Direct, direct, actor, director. Somebody director. called up two weeks ago and said, is this Rob Reiner's office? Second name of the Eggers. Is he the director? I said, yeah, he's the director. Can I talk to him about Spinal Tap? <laughs> Actually, my Uncle Max went to school with Paul Reiner in the Bronx. But this is a drone. And you can get the signal into the VR glasses. So, I mean, like, I'm a nut about this. I love gadgets. When I was 10 years old, my father built me dark room and I developed black and white. I'm always into this weird stuff. I wrote my dissertation teaching women to be assertive using videotape feedback. Basically, poor man's virtual reality. But YouTube right now has 3D stuff. So that's a great mind for this stuff. You know, everything is on YouTube right now. So if someone can't make a left-handed turn on the George Washington Bridge and the toll's going this way and the sun's coming up in the west, it's on YouTube. You know, uh, that's saved a lot of aggravation. If you, even a two-dimensional presentation is effective. You know, the 3D effect is way overrated. So. I, I, I had a quick question. I think it was sort of related to the earlier questions too, but sort of a lot of the examples you talked about were like specific phobias and things yeah. like that. Um, Generalized anxiety and, works well for it too. So yeah, what would sexual problems that work well for? So it? like something more general, like generalized anxiety or something like that. Yeah. What would that sort of look like with virtual? Reality? You mean when you say generalized anxiety, what you're really talking about is somebody whose nervous system produces false alarms. Right. right. And that's the most common complaint we hear. Someone says, you know what? I know I shouldn't worry about this, but I can't stop worrying about it. That's my problem. I know it's not real, but it's still good. It's like a wildfire in their mind. The RSA breathing is very good for that. And brainwave training. Neurofeedback, in my opinion, which is in its infancy right now, will one day replace psychotropic medication. We're just beginning to see what this stuff can do. And it's all based on operant conditioning. But uh, you know, there, there are technical problems with it. Uh, it's hard to read human brainwaves because we got this skull in there. You know, I'd love to be able to like carve off the top of something that's like a pumpkin and take it up and put a machine in there. Then we could do some real things. The skull is a pain in the neck. Some people go in through the tongue, by the way. The tongue is an amazing thing our tongues can do. Go on, I'm sorry. Do you partner with technology companies? All the time. So I used to work with drug companies a lot. We built in, what, in, what, in what capacity? I mean, do no. they give you money? Do you give you equipment? Do they do you research for them? In what really capacity well. do you partner with technology companies? Uh, you asked me if they gave me money? In what capacity do you collaborate with technology uh, companies? I taught them how to, once again, based on the premise that human beings are fundamentally irrational, but predictably irrational, I taught them, a big problem in this country is medication non-compliance. person gets diagnosed with high cholesterol, 50% of people lapse after 30 days of taking Lipitor, and that kills people. So if you can get them to figure out what the dimensions are, you know, there are 14 dimensions we uncover. And if you message these people with that in mind, you improve compliance and you save lives. It's the only time I ever worked where the federal government, the AMA, and the drug companies were all on the same side of an issue. That's very rare. Uh, I, don't asked, uh, I don't think you answered my question. Ask in what capacity do you work with technology companies? I, I, there's so many different ways I've done oh. it. I, that's why I'm, I'm giving you an example. Okay. Uh, um, well, people have 
problems with employees, for example, um, calling in sick on Monday. Yeah. They lose a lot of money. So I've been asked what to do, you know, ways to incentivize people not to do that. So if it costs people money in the short run, they make it way back in the long run. And when I could prove that to them, they invested money. Okay, so you do research with them? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, look, I'm a trained psychologist, I'm trained clinically and to do research. So I, you know, I know how to do everything. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Point is, I'm, that's, that's what I'm trained to do. Uh, so, I, 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 I mean, if you go to my website, we have examples of all this stuff. You, you know, there's a lot of different stuff. Uh, but to me, the fun part is using these devices in clever ways. Like, whoever thought a drone would be used to cure for your client? Then I figured out a way to do it to catch big fish. Can I do that? If you're a surf cast on a beach, the big problem is the waves, right? Getting your line out over the waves. I took a drone and I put a, I attached the hook on it and I flew it straight out 200 yards. When the line went taut, it dropped the, the bait in, right? So now I'm 60 feet of water. I'm catching fish like 30, 40 inches long. Is that cheating? Maybe. Anything else? Yeah. Do I work with Microsoft? No, Microsoft is not big into virtual reality. They're into augmented reality. Yeah, that's true. That HoloLens is very impressive. Uh, I just couldn't figure out what I would use it for. Well, they actually, uh, you know, I'm working on a project for you. If I were an architect, I would buy it. Well, um, we're going to use it uh, with a team of people to create exercise program for astronauts in space. So make their exercise fun because they also like, they miss nature and earth, you know, and some of that. So adding that on top of their exercise program, that's what we're working on. So, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, uh, you do really experience situations. The most realistic thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's definitely lived up to the hype and exceeded it. So. That's it. Thank you, guys.